Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 1 this morning. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learnt it from Epaphras, our fellow beloved servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience and with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray together. Righteous Heavenly Father, we thank You for the many blessings that You have given us this morning. We thank You for the rain. Uh, that refle- refreshes our land. Father, we thank You especially for the opportunity that we have to be together to worship You. And I pray, Father, that our worship is pleasing to You and that we're building each other up in everything that we do. Father, we thank You for the faith which we share. Uh, we're thankful, Father, for the faith that we have in the Word of Truth. And Father, uh, we pray as Paul was praying, that we increase in spiritual wisdom and understanding, that we grow in the faith to your glory and in your service. Thank you, Father, for blessing us in Jesus, for delivering the faith through Him, forgiving us of our sins, atoning for our sins with His blood. Father, we're thankful for the hope that we have in the resurrection, and we look forward, Father, to that great day when all things will be set right. It's in Jesus' name that we offer our prayer. Amen. All right, well, it is a good morning to be together, and we're thankful to have all of you all out this morning. Um, we want to especially welcome our visitors this morning, and you know, if you're visiting with us this morning, you know, know that you are always welcome here, and you know, I don't think that I'm going to disillusion any of our regular congregants here by saying this, hopefully not, but this is, this is not the place where all of the super righteous people get together. Right now, if I've just disillusioned you with that, welcome to Christianity. Um, but this is where we get sinful people together. All right, we are here because we are leaning on God's grace, not on our own graces. We are here because we're leaning on the righteousness of Christ, not our own righteousness. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we hope that you feel comfortable here, hope that you feel welcome here, um, and I pray that everything that we're doing here today is helping to build you up because that's what we seek to do here. You know, we seek to build each other up uh, in our faith in Christ. Uh, we seek to honor God in everything that we do. So, welcome, welcome here. We've just finished a study in Luke's Gospel. And having finished that, I, I want us to spend a little bit of time in the epistles. Uh, because Paul here is talking about the the outgrowth of the gospel, the result of the gospel. In fact, he talks about the gospel bearing fruit and increasing the whole world over in the passage that we just read. 
And so I want us to to look at that because that's going to be our response to the gospel. How does the gospel bear fruit in us and how do we turn around and bear fruit in the world? Paul's writing to some brethren in a place called Colossae. Uh, It was reached during Paul's missionary journeys, but Paul was not the one who preached the word in Colossae. He's not met these brethren here. Um, He identifies a man named Epaphras as the evangelist who shared the gospel with them. Nevertheless, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And more than that, he is their brother. They are brothers together in Christ. And so he feels obligated to follow up on this work that Epaphras has started, uh, to follow up on the work among the Gentiles here in Colossae. And he begins by telling them about two types of prayer that he offers on their behalf. Prayers of thanksgiving because of them, and prayers of intercession for them. In these texts, we learn a couple of things. We learn, first off, what we ought to be praying for ourselves and for each other. And also, as we're looking at these prayers, these prayers orient us in the faith. Uh, Paul kind of lays out here what the faith is about, uh, just in very general, rough terms, showing us the direction that we should be going in Christ. And so I want us to look through these two prayers today, the prayer of thanksgiving and the prayer of intercession that we just read. So let's start in the prayer of thanksgiving. Paul says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Excuse me. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Paul here is giving thanks for the fruit that the gospel is bearing in Colossae. Just as it's bearing fruit all over the world, he says, so it is bearing fruit among you. I want us to talk about what that fruit is. But I also want us to begin by understanding that what we're about to talk about is the fruit of the gospel. This is the response to the gospel. Once you have heard the gospel, this is what ought to be welling up in you. This is what you ought to be producing. The qualities that Paul is giving thanks for here, these are the outgrowth of the gospel. Now, the fruit of the gospel consists of three qualities that we hear pretty often in scriptures in our description of the faith. Let's read this first a little bit again and see if you pick up on something familiar. Paul says, We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Here in this first sentence we hear the familiar formula, faith, hope, and love. Your faith in Christ Jesus, the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now this is a different order than we're used to hearing them in. We're used to hearing faith, hope, and love out of 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul presents it in that order. You know, faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. And so not only are we hearing them in a different order, we're also hearing them in a slightly different priority here. Because in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, Paul is focusing on love. And love is the supreme virtue that guides the other virtues. Here, (coughs) excuse me, Paul has phrased the relationship a little differently. Not just faith, love, and then hope, but faith and love because of hope. That's what he said. Your faith in Christ Jesus, the love that you have for all of the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. That in some way, 
Our hope is governing our faith and our love. Our hope informs and educates us on how to, uh, to go about the faith and go about loving each other. Now, I want us to talk about this formula a little bit this morning. Uh, we need to say a few words about faith in Christ before we continue with anything else. Uh, because I'm afraid that we have a, an impoverished understanding of the phrase faith in Christ. Mainly because we have uh, an, uh, a deficient understanding of the word faith. We completely miss Paul's explanations unless we understand what he's getting at a little bit beforehand. Because the rest of the letter, all throughout this letter, Paul is going to be focusing on faith, love, and hope as three of his major themes. He's going to expand on all of this throughout the letter to the Colossians. And so we need to understand what faith in Christ Jesus means, what love for all the saints means, and what the hope laid up for you in heaven means. And we commonly take faith in Christ to mean just belief in Jesus. Uh, if you have faith in Christ, you believe that He exists, you believe that Jesus is real, you believe that He is the Son of God. And indeed, that is part of what Scripture means by faith. Part of what Scripture means by faith is belief. But that is not all that Scripture means by faith, which is what makes it an impoverished understanding of faith. I don't want to make the whole sermon about this, um, so let us briefly look at what Scripture has to say about faith. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 7. So here I think yeah, Moses lays it out pretty succinctly. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. And he's going to talk about faith both from God's perspective and from our perspective. That is the faith that God's people have and the faith that God has. And by the way, that's, that's a symptom of our impoverished understanding of the word faith is that we don't often think about God having faith. But the scripture says that he does. Or rather that he is in faith. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set His love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that He swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate Him by destroying them. He will not be slack with the one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. Now there where Moses says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. Notice the way that Moses describes God. He is the faithful God. Because faith is not just about belief in Scripture. Faith is centered on the covenant. God offers His blessings in good faith. In other words, He is trustworthy. He does what He says. He does what is right towards His people. Notice the way that Moses describes all of this. The Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that He swore to your fathers. That is faith. God doing as He said He would do to Israel's fathers. That is why the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He is the God who keeps covenant. That is why He is faithful. And what he asks in return 
with is that likewise we be faithful. He asks for our covenant obedience in good faith, just as He offers His covenant blessings in good faith. That is, faith is a two-way street. Faith affirms that God is trustworthy. We don't just believe that He exists, but as the Hebrew writer says, that He is also a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. That is, we trust Him. Faith moves us, then, to be trustworthy in our response to God's trustworthiness. That faith in Christ does not just mean belief in Christ, but it's talking about faithfulness. It's talking about trustworthiness. It is talking about keeping covenant in Christ. When Paul writes about faith in Christ, he is talking about living a faithful life in Christ. And we're going to see that reflected all throughout the letter to the Colossians. Otherwise, faith in Christ would just be kind of a throwaway phrase here at the beginning of the letter. But it means placing our trust in Christ as opposed to placing our trust in other things. And as we're going to read, the the brethren in Colossae had started putting their trust in some other things rather than putting their trust in Jesus. And it also means living in obedience to Christ, which again the Colossian brethren, as we'll see, had started falling away from. And Paul is calling them back to faith in Christ that they put their trust in Him and that they obey Him. And so that is what Paul means whenever he says faith in Christ. So Paul gives thanks for the faith, the love, and the hope that these Colossian brethren already have because of the gospel. And notice, that's where it comes from. That is how you get faith. That is how you live in love. That is how you have hope is through the gospel, the good news of Jesus of Nazareth. And so Paul, having given thanks for what they already have, then prays for them to grow in what they have. They pray for that fruit to grow and fulfill its purpose. I go back to Colossians 1 verse 9. So from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The nature of this growth that He's talking about, and by the way, we've seen this in Jesus' parables. All right, what is the point of fruit? All right, it, we might be tricked into thinking that the point of fruit is tasting good, right? because that's our experience with fruit. It's there so you can eat it. The point of a plant is to bear fruit, and the point of the fruit is to produce more plants. Right, and that's it. You produce more plants so you can produce more fruit, and those fruit produce more plants. It's a pattern of growth. It is a cycle of growth. And that's what Paul is asking for here. He says the gospel has borne fruit in Colossae, just as it's borne fruit all over the earth. And then he asks them, he says, I've been praying for you so that you can bear fruit in every good work. So they need to be growing so that they can produce that fruit. The nature of that growth, Paul says, that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. What is it that makes us grow in faith, love, and hope? Paul says it's the knowledge of God. It is coming to know God and to know His will in spiritual wisdom and understanding. But notice the way he qualifies that. He doesn't just say coming to know God. In other words, the intellectual component of that, knowing the will of God, is not sufficient. 
Because, brethren, there are plenty of people who know the will of God who don't do it. And there are plenty of people who do the will of God, but who hate it. They're not doing it out of any sort of faith, love, or hope. There are all sorts of reasons why you might keep yourself in line for reasons outside of the faith. Right? Lots of people are motivated by fear. Lots of people are motivated by embarrassment or guilt. Paul says to be filled with the knowledge of His will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul prays that we understand God so that we can know Him in wisdom. Because we all know that there is a big difference between being smart and being wise. Right? We know lots of people who are smart that we would never call wise. And we know lots of people that, you know, they, they wouldn't score too highly uh, you know, on a standardized test, but you would go to them for advice. So they may not be smart, but they've got a lot of wisdom. We know there's a difference. Like, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, right? That it's not a vegetable. But it's wisdom that knows that you would never, ever put a tomato in a fruit salad. It's a big difference, right? Paul says you need to have both. You need to grow in knowledge, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And the implication of this is that there is a sort... First off, there's a sort of knowledge that is not according to spiritual wisdom and understanding. And then by further qualifying that wisdom and understanding as spiritual wisdom and understanding... Paul's implying that there is a sort of wisdom, a sort of understanding that is not spiritual and that we need to guard against it. We're going to see both of those things play out over the course of this epistle. The purpose of this growth, he says that he wants us to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. What does it mean to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord? What's it mean to be fully pleasing to him? Paul follows up with a series of qualifiers. And if you're, you know, I've got to apologize. I'm reading from the ESV. And here the ESV uh, butchers the language a bit. Um, Most of the translations that I've looked at butcher it to some degree or another. Um, What he says is, "...bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of the Lord, being strengthened with all power." according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. Most of our translations kind of break it up there in the middle. The ESV slaps a period there after increasing in the knowledge of God and says, for some reason that is beyond my understanding, may you be strengthened. That doesn't reflect the the Greek that's there. Paul intends for us to understand all of these things together. You walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You please the Lord by bearing fruit, by increasing in knowledge, by being strengthened, by giving thanks. Paul's going to reflect on all of those things over the course of the letter. But that's the basic equipment that we're looking at. That is, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road for us. That we ought to be bearing fruit, that we ought to be growing in our knowledge, that we ought to be strengthened. And by the way, notice here, this is, when we start talking about things that we ought to do or things that we need to improve in, we always think of it in terms of active stuff. You know, like, if there, if there is a verb that needs to be done, we're the subject of that verb. We're the ones getting it done. All right, We're the ones bearing fruit. We're the ones increasing in knowledge. But notice here, Paul slips in something here in the passive voice. Being strengthened. Part of the equipment here, part of this growth process, does not originate in us. Because who's doing the strengthening? But the Lord Himself. Look at this being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might 
for all endurance and patience with joy. That it's His strength that we're leaning on. He's the one who's giving us the ability to endure. He's the one who's giving us this joy that comes from His strength. And that's why Paul is praying for them. Because that's, that's our access to this. His prayer. It's not something that originates in us, but originates in God. So the call for us this morning is that we have an everlasting hope in front of us. Remember, that's, that's the way Paul qualifies all of this. We have faith in Christ Jesus, love for all of the saints, because of the hope laid up in heaven. All right, now we've only dealt with things in, in very broad, uh, loose terms this morning, just as Paul has done here. He's not developed any of these ideas yet. We only have a, an outline of what all of these things mean. But I do want to call you to this everlasting hope that we have in front of us. We know that all of us face the end of our days eventually. Right? Given long enough, everybody's chances of survival hit zero. Now, that's just the sad fact of life. And at the end of all of that, one day we face judgment. Now, what Paul's talking about here is a hopeful thing. I mean, that's why he uses the word hope, right? But at the end of all of this, we've got something laid up for us in heaven. To achieve that hope... We must live in love and in faith. All right now, the world, the world apes all of these qualities. All right, the world puts on a show like it has love. All right, and it's it it annoys it annoys me to death. You go out and you see all of these cliches out in the world. Stuff like love wins. Um, the world thinks it's got an idea of what love means. But remember, Paul said that you need to be growing according to spiritual wisdom and understanding. What the world has on offer is not according to spiritual wisdom and understanding. What the world has on offer is something that looks flashy, something that looks nice, something that promises blessings. But they're empty promises. At the end of your life, you're dead. It's our goal then to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. To walk after His calling. And Paul says that all comes from the gospel. That's how all of this starts. The gospel gets preached in Colossae. They respond to it. The seeds are planted in them and they are growing and they're on their way to bearing fruit themselves. As we study, as we come to know the will of God, as we respond to the gospel, we grow. And while we're growing, we pray. We give thanks to God for what we have. And we pray for God to give us more. We're eager for what fruit we will bear. But it all starts with responding to the gospel. Please take out your songbooks. Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. He lived among men a perfect life and offered Himself as an atoning sacrifice for sin. So that we can call on Him, join in His covenant... And if we live in faith and in love, we have that hope laid out before us. But it begins with answering the gospel. It begins with joining that covenant. Remember what Moses said, that God is the faithful God who keeps covenant. And Jesus, He lays out the pattern. Right? You hear the word, you hear the gospel. You repent of your sins, and as you turn away from it, you reject it. You say, that's the way I've been going, now I'm going to be faithful. You confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and the only atoning sacrifice. You be baptized 
into His death, burial, and resurrection. And that's the covenant. And then you live in faith, in love, and in hope. If you've not done that this morning, if you are outside of that covenant, if you have not responded to the Gospel, the only time that you are guaranteed is right now. Nobody knows when their time is going to come. We do not know when the Lord is going to return again. And so we implore you, respond to the Gospel today. It may be that you have responded to the Gospel, but like these brothers in Colossae, you have begun slipping away, placing your trust in other things, that you are in need of repentance, and it may be that that something has happened and you're in need of restoration. Whether you need prayers, restoration, baptism, whatever your need may be, we stand ready to take care of those things. If you'll make your need known by coming forward, as together we stand and sing. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you for evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, there's power, wonder-working power in the blood. In the blood of the Lamb. Thank you for this day that you've given us. 